and as such to be not really threatened by assassination. Um, so that was very much a common practice um, under Victoria and Britain. Um, in other cases, uh, when assassins were taken seriously by the state, they became a political threat, as it were, and, and then needed to be executed. Um, but in general terms, were they mentally impaired? Frequently, yes. I mean, we get a lot of people that are, as this woman who threw the axe after the Kaisers. Hi guys, so today is Tuesday the 28th of July, and I don't know how much I filmed yesterday. I think I'm just going to join these couple of days together in one video and, and join together the clips because, yeah, as I said before, we have quite busy days. So, so I don't get the chance to really film something like in depth and for a longer period. So, yeah, I'll just do what I can. But once again, it's just amazing to be here. The second week, as you know, I have have just about started here and this week I have classes about Elizabeth I and the Age of Gloriana and Lord Nelson as the ultimate naval hero and I'm really getting as much out of it as I possibly can before I leave to go home on Saturday but yeah it's so amazing to be here it's such a privilege it really is yeah I, today I just I was struck with like a feeling of awe and yeah it just feels so surreal to be here and it's just incredible so stay tuned for the next couple of days hello again guys so i just had a great time at dinner we were a bunch of us and we were like in fits of laughter that's a sign of a good dinner and right now i'm on my way to a lecture the evening lecture it's about john locke so I'm very excited for that. I'm going to take you with me. It's the same big hall. It's called Lady Mitchell Hall that the other clips from my lectures or one of the clips I have put in from my lectures have been in there. So I'm taking you with me. I'm going to film a part of the answer session, I think. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. I'm just going to show you the way down through the reception because it's it's a long way. They have... The corridor down there, which I'm about to walk through, it's the second longest in the entire world. So, and it's really long. So I'm gonna show you. So this is the first floor and I'm going to go downstairs now. You're not going to believe how long this hole is. Yeah, that's basically Newnham College for you. <laughs> and our classes are right across the road in the various buildings over here, which you will have seen in some of my vlogs. Yeah, that's a good thing to do first. Yeah, okay. Julia. Hi, nice. 
But Locke's present huge reputation was built from the 1930s onwards against fascism and communism. I don't have time to go into it, but in fact, Locke in the 19th century did not have the same stature, the same reputation as he does today. You can trace its growth from the 1930s onwards. A particularly silly version of it by a great philosopher, Bertrand Russell, in his book, The History of Western Philosophy, published in 1945, at the end of the war, has this rather strange remark. Hitler is the outcome of Rousseau. That's referring again to that idea I expressed that somehow Rousseau's the wrong sort of liberalism. It's too schematic, too philosophical. Um, it leads the wrong, the wrong way to dictators. He goes on, Hitler is the outcome of Rousseau. Roosevelt and Churchill are the outcome of Locke. Well, that's a reductive piece of history, if ever there was one. There's a nice example of Locke being used quite deliberately for denazification after the Second World War. There's a, Ger there's a, um, a German Jewish historian of philosophy called Raymond Krebansky, who died in 2005, who settled in Canada after fleeing Germany in 1933, who worked for the political warfare executive during the war and then was employed by the British in the denazification program in the late 40s and 50s. Well, when he then became a professor in Canada, he set about translating John Locke's letter on toleration into a number of languages. Which language did he choose first? Ein Brief über Toleranz, the German translation published in Hamburg. Next translation, Lettere sulla toleranza, Italian. Next translation, I shall begin to recite it in Japanese. <laughs> Next one, Carta sopra la tolerancia, Spanish. And so it went on with his various translations. So Locke is quite deliberately there, part of a program of re education. I'm just going to say hello to you. I'm going to type hello in the machine. It's going to make a code. Let's see what it does. So we do have this set of letters down here. There. So I'm going to type in hello. So H will be first. Let's do that. And it does work for me. If I press the H yet, yeah. and you can see that. There again. That's the letter K lighting up, and that's the code. So the code will light up here on this set. So H was K in the code. Hello is the message. Let's do E. Let's see what I get. I press the E, you can see that, that's the letter Z lighting up there. If I do the L in hello, L becomes G. If I do the second L in hello, second L becomes O. And we'll finish it with you there. And that's C down there. There you go, that's the code. Now this machine doesn't transmit the code by it doesn't transmit, it's just in send. So if someone has to stand next to you, and they're looking over your shoulder like that, and they're writing that down on a piece of paper. Then you can send that piece of paper, Morse code, radiating with something like that. But you may notice something weird about that code when I did that. The two L's in hello were different letters, right? This is why the Germans thought it was not the way code, right? So a double letter might not be a double letter. Let me do this again. So if I press A here while it's close to me, if I press the A, so that's a W, you can see it. If I keep pressing A, it's actually a different letter each time I do it. It's a bit, there's no pattern to that. There's no way to know what it's going to be next. And that's why I thought it was an unbreakable character. Okay. So let's open this up. I can open this up like this. So these are the insides of Enigma. Uh, things to point out to you. So we've got, you can see, three rows of lights there, little lights there at the top. And then we've got these three big wheels. So those wheels are called rotors. Inside those rotors, 
It's full of wiring. Right? Imagine inside. It's full of wiring. All the wiring inside is crisscrossed. That's where it's all full of It's all wool. It's like spaghetti inside. Imagine all those wires mixed up inside. But look what happens when I press a letter. You see that? The rotors move when I type. So I press this, this is click, 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 it moves. When this is a full turn, it's going to kick the middle rotor forward to one place. Let's see if I can do this. I think it's happening now, like that. Then you'll keep going. So when it does a full turn, it kicks the middle rotor one place forwards. When the middle rotor finally does a full turn, it kicks the left rotor one place forwards. So you've got the fast rotor, you've got the middle rotor, you've got the slow rotor. Uh, I like to think of it like it's hands on clock, like it's a minute hand, hour hand, second hand. It works in the same way. So once the fast one does a turn, one does a turn. Now, other things to show you, these rotors actually come out. You can actually take these out and swap the order as well. Each rotor has 26 starting places. And one other thing to show you, down here at the front, this is not easy to see. I'm going to try to show you. Down here, in black, down here, I'll pull this out. I'll put it in my hand. So we've got wires down here at the front as well. If you change the position of these wires, we change the code to we've got some wires down here. We have about six of these wires at the beginning. Now, I think I can explain how this works to you. I think I can explain it. Because all this is, it's a battery and a light. It's a simple circuit, it's a battery connected to a light. And that's all it is. how quickly time has flown by. Today is my last full day here. It's just so surreal that it's over so soon. I leave tomorrow morning to go to the airport and then my plane is at 8 in the evening. So yeah, I will have some time to wait. <laughs> but I just don't want to leave this view. I've just fallen so in love with this view. It's just incredible. I've sat here a lot just looking out. It's just so unreal and I've had such a good time. So I think I'm not really sure what I have filmed over the last couple of days, but I think I'm just going to join it all together to, to give an impression of what I have done so far. But today I have my last day of classes, so I'm going to go and get the most out of my last time here. And tonight is the closing dinner, so it's a bit more formal with a feast, a feast evening meal. So that's gonna be good. So let the last day begin. <laughs> but we've really enjoyed it. Uh, we, we always enjoyed working with you. We've particularly enjoyed this, this year. It's been great having you with us. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it as well. We hope something of our own enthusiasm and passion for history has come across mm -hmm. over the two weeks. And we hope very much to see you back here very soon. Please, please come again next year. Please keep coming. <laughs>
So the rest of the afternoon is just free time. It's now four o'clock. So I just can't get over this. Simply can't get over it. I haven't been down here before. So beautiful. Okay guys, so look at where I'm sitting right now. This is unbelievable. Look at this. There are butterflies flying around. It's just totally idyllic. Look at this. I'm sitting here on this monument, I guess. Just sat right there. Look at butterfly. Oh my god. Look at this. I just can't. I can't. It's so good. Let's go. I can't. <laughs> I simply can't. <laughs> wow. I'm like lost for words. I'm gonna have to sit down to just soak all this in. Because I've never been down here before, which is a big mistake. But yeah, now I'm soaking it all in. The Newnham Gardens are so spectacular.
So good evening guys, now it's the evening, I'm just sitting on the floor and I'm done packing now and yeah, I'm just charging everything for tomorrow and we have ordered a taxi already to take us to the bus. I think we will wait there for a bit, but that's fine. Me, It's me and the Greek girl who are going together, so it's nice that the two of us are leaving at the same time. But I just wanted to like end everything by showing you my diploma. We just got them, as you will have seen, we had a ceremonious evening down at the dining hall and they all presented us. It was, it was very formal. With They shouted our names and we had to go up and shake their hands to say thank you and we got a diploma to certify that we've been here. And it's just so amazing. Look at this. University of Cambridge History Summer School, 19th of July to the 1st of August. Certificate of Attendance, and then that's me, and my four courses. So, yeah. I just have to round everything up by saying that it has been such an amazing experience to be here. It has been so inspiring and so like an evolving process in a number of ways. I've gotten so much out of this. It has just been one of the most rewarding experiences ever in my life so far and one of the biggest achievements in my life yet. So it's such a privilege to have been here. So all positivity for me. Now I'm just about to go to sleep soon and then waking up for breakfast tomorrow at 8. So see you then.